So many have heard about uh, Alexander Fleming and his serendipitous discovery of penicillin. He was looking at a petri dish and noticed that the staff that was growing on the petri dish was dying in the presence of a fungus. And that fungus was creating a chemical called penicillin. And it took more than a dozen years to bring that discovery to patients. But by the mid-1940s, penicillin became widely available. And that story has been told many times, but I think people often don't know what happened after that. What happened after penicillin became this life-changing drug in 1945? Well, that ushered in what we call the golden era of drug development. The 1950s was this incredible decade where all of these new antibiotics and medications became uh, approved for use and life expectancy blossomed and it was one of these incredible periods of scientific discovery. But then something else happened. In the 1960s, a number of prominent scientists came out and said, you know, we kind of have this infectious disease issue kicked. It's time for us to focus on more pressing issues like heart disease and cancer. And so the pharmaceutical industry started focusing on other conditions. And they found that those were very profitable conditions. And what happened was this occurred at a time that these bacteria and fungi and parasites started mutating. And while no one was looking, they started mutating into superbugs, just as we were losing the momentum of creating new antibiotics. And so in the 1970s and 80s, there were no new classes of antibiotics that were discovered. There were new variations of the ones we already had, but there were no new classes. And we didn't appreciate the scope of this issue until the 1990s. And by then, many thought it was too late. What happened was we went back to the pharmaceutical companies and said, we need more antibiotics. And they said, we don't want to make them. It's a bad business model. And the reason for that why would it be that, what's so different about an antibiotic? Well, compare it with a blood pressure medication. A guy like me says about a blood pressure medication, I'd prescribe it to somebody and I say, take this pill once a day, every day for the rest of your life. That's a really good business model. And then compare that to an antibiotic, where a doctor like me is stingy about doling it out. I only give it in small, short courses, five days, seven days. And then even that great antibiotic is eventually going to encounter a, a drug-resistant path pathogen. So the pharmaceutical companies say, we spend billions of dollars developing drugs, and we've got to get a return on our investment, and there's no guarantee we're going to get that. And what they point to is a uh, study from the London School of Economics that says that when a company invests in a new antibiotic, they typically lose $50 million. And that is not something that they're eager to do. So how do we get around that? Well, there are a number of different proposals that are on the table. I write about a company called Allergan. They are a pharmaceutical company that makes uh, a number of different antibiotics. And what you can do, um, you're going to be hearing more about these types of proposals that are on the table to get pharmaceutical companies interested in making more antibiotics. It hasn't really entered the mainstream um, political discourse yet, but we're going to be hearing about this in 2020 and beyond, hearing what uh, presidential candidates think about these proposals because they would involve the federal government getting more involved in um, drug discovery and development. So there's something called a push incentive, which is to go to a pharmaceutical company like Allergan that is very good at making antibiotics but is losing interest in it and saying, you also make Botox. You had three billion dollars in sales last year making Botox and your corporate tax rate is 18 percent. We could give you a tax cut and make it so that your tax rate is only 15% if you promise to invest the excess profits into new antibiotics. So that's a provocative idea. It's a guaranteed way to inject more money into the system for uh, the pipeline. On the other hand, you're giving a tax break to a multi-billion dollar company that headquarters itself in Dublin so that it can avoid paying as many taxes as possible. And you're also going to be going to companies like Johnson & Johnson that's very good at making antibiotics, companies that have just been embroiled in the opioid scandals where they have intentionally misled people and offering them tax cuts to make antibiotics. We haven't heard how politicians feel about this, but this is one such proposal that's on the table. There's something else called a pull incentive, which is to go to a company and say, we recognize that it takes at least 10, be 10 years and a billion dollars to take a discovery in a test tube and to test it in animals and in healthy human volunteers and to get through all the FDA approval. 
And right now you only get five to seven years of market exclusivity. What if we gave you 25 years or 30? You could charge more money for these drugs and you could get the return on the investment that you're so desperately interested in. That's called a pull incentive. And so when I was doing research for my book, I talked with uh, an endless number of scientists who had opinions on these incentives, and, but I found very few lay people had, who had even heard of these things. So those are one half of the argument. The other half of the argument is to say to the pharmaceutical companies, you don't want to make new antibiotics? Well, good riddance. That antibiotics should be viewed as a public good and the federal government should make them. That they should be viewed like electricity or water. And that what we should do is pool our resources with the European Union and with uh, Australia and whoever else and completely disentangle profits and dollars and cents from this and just say, we all need to chip in to make these and we should all share them. That's a provocative idea as well. And one of the surprises I had in doing research for my book was that when I spoke to people at the Nas National Institute of Health, um, the government wing that's responsible for this, they said that's a terrible idea. They said the federal government doesn't, should not be a pharmaceutical company. The federal government is very good at identifying talented scientists and, and funding their research to discover new antibiotics, but they should not be part of the uh, development of them. I don't have a dog in this fight, but I'll tell you those are the kind of conversations that are happening uh, at uh, in infectious disease conferences around the world. And they're the kind of things that are going to continue to be discussed, hopefully more and more in the public. So that's talking about antibiotics. But that's only one arm of this. There are a number of other ways to try to treat these drug-resistant microbes. Uh, there's something called bacteriophage therapy. I don't know if anyone has heard about this, but this is one of these things that at the cutting edge that is just starting to come out as a viable treatment option for patients with superbugs. So bacteriophages are these viruses that can essentially cause bacteria to explode. And they've been around for over, we've known about them for over 100 years. And there was some work in the 1970s and 80s, uh, mostly in Russia, uh, looking at bacteriophage therapy. And then it kind of fell away for 30 years. And it's now come back because we see this tremendous potential for it. And the big story was in May of this year that there was a 15-year-old girl in London who had a superbug infection in her lung. It's called Mycobacterium abscessus. And she had been treated with long courses of antibiotics for years and years with no cure, no improvement. And a team of scientists put together a cocktail of bacteriophages. And they used CRISPR. I think people in the room probably heard of CRISPR. It's a molecular scalpel that allows you to alter DNA and RNA. And they used CRISPR to create a cocktail to treat this girl. And they cured her. And it was met with tremendous fanfare, uh, on front page of the Wall Street Journal. And I was asked to comment on this. And my I, concern was that the pharmaceutical industry is very excited about broad spectrum antibiotics. And here we're talking about the exact opposite of that. We're talking about a treatment to address a very specific pathogen. And I said, rather than focusing on the downside of this, which is that it's a very narrow treatment, I said, this could be an opportunity for the federal government to step in and say, this is a life-changing treatment that is never going to turn a profit because it is so narrow in its spectrum. But it may be worth it for the federal government to invest in this and to invest in this kind of technology. So that's sort of one of the future uh, of looking at how we're going to address this. And it's really essentially getting into personalized medicine. Could we come up with a personalized treatment for your infection? So what I wanted to do uh, when I was writing about this story was I had all of these thoughts going through my head of how do you tell this story about superbugs? You know, the stuff that I've just brought up this, thus far. It seems like a lot of facts, but that doesn't make for a very entertaining book to just hammer somebody with facts. So what I wanted to do was to tell a story. And I found my story by noticing what was missing from a lot of the superbug stories I was reading. And that was the patients. That I was always reading about how we got into this scenario of superbugs, how we were misusing antibiotics, and I'll get into this a little bit later this evening. We were misusing antibiotics, which was promoting resistance, uh, and we were hearing about how the microbes were mutating, but I wasn't hearing anything about the patients who were experiencing this, or the doctors who were treating them. 
And so what I decided to do was write a book about a clinical trial that I was working on with a new antibiotic called Dalbavancin. It had been approved by the FDA in 2014, but our hospital refused to carry it. It was for the treatment of skin infections, something called cellulitis, and with one dose you could cure the skin infection. The problem was the company said we're charging $4,000 a dose. And the treatment that we were using at the hospital was $40 a dose. And the way it works at hospitals is there's something called a formulary committee. You might not know about this. I didn't know about it until a few years ago. That after a drug gets approved by the FDA, a committee decides whether, at each hospital, decides whether or not to add it. And the pharmacy said our budget will be bankrupt if we add this drug, Dalbavancin. But I saw an opportunity, which was that this drug could get people out of the hospital more quickly. One dose and you could leave. And our hospital is bursting at the seams. If you came into the emergency room right now and wanted to be admitted to the hospital, you might wait 30 hours for a bed, 36 hours. I've had people wait 72 hours. And so if there would be a way to get the engine moving and getting patients processed more quickly, we might have an opportunity. But it, the goal of this is not just to process patients. And as I found out, talking with the doctors I work with, they weren't exactly enthusiastic about meeting a new patient who was complaining of a really serious superbug infection, giving them a dose of a medication, and then just sending them on their way. So many of the doctors that I work with said, why would I want to use this drug? I won't be able to see if my patients actually get better. And then I went to what turned out to be the nemesis of my book, which is the Institutional Review Board. I don't know how many of you are researchers here. I see some nods. But if you want to do an experiment on a human being at my hospital, you can't just walk in and start testing people. If I see something that Dr. Oz is promoting on his show, I can't just show up and say, here it is. I have to appeal to a institutional review board that's put in place to make sure that what I'm doing is ethically sound. And so as I was working through that, I started getting very interested in the history of medical ethics. And I'm on the ethics committee at my hospital. And I didn't really know that much about why we have an IRB. And that part ends up in my book, looking at how it used to be that physicians were free to govern themselves and decide what was ethical and what wasn't. And that allowed for a lot of very bad things to happen, where physicians were injecting hepatitis virus into children and in injecting cancer cells into people without their knowledge because they were doing it for the good of science. And then there was the Tuskegee nightmare that when the whistleblower brought that to everyone's attention in 1972, changed the entire landscape forever of how physicians could conduct research. And so <clears throat> as I was working on this clinical trial coming together, I was simultaneously writing the book. And what I did was I convinced the company to give me a bunch of their drug for free, Dalbavancin. And then I started approaching patients and saying, do you want to be a part of my clinical trial? And they would say, who are you? Why are you asking me? And I had this very thick packet of, of a consent form that I would go to patients with. And I'd say, well, you have what's known as a superbug or a multidrug resistant organism. We have a new antibiotic that we're testing and we'd like to see if it works on you. And the first person I ever gave this drug to, and the first one ever to receive it at my hospital, was a lawyer who had been, uh, spent his career protecting the interests of a Fortune 500 company. And he flipped through the consent form and then he put it down on his lap and he said, Dr. McCarthy, I just have one question. Would you give this drug to your own mother? Which kind of took me aback because I had been considering this trial from a hundred different angles, but I had never considered it from that angle. And I fumbled for a few seconds and then I said, yeah, actually I would. I would give it to her. And he said, okay, that's good enough for me. Let's do it. And those are the little moments that I found so fascinating while I was working on this trial, the kind of things that I wanted to write about. Uh, how do you capture the human element of one person saying, can I experiment on you? And finding out that you don't know what's going to happen next. 